Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life, the podcast. This is Life Coach Brittany Young, and you're listening to Authors Corner, where we highlight and showcase local authors. Today, I'm speaking to Joel Dubin, author of The Seven High Habits of Highly Dysfunctional Companies. And Joel and I are going to be talking on the topic, How Dysfunctional Is Your Company? Calculating the AHO density ratio. And I said that nicely. <laughs> Welcome, Joel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me, Myrna. I'm, I'm glad to be a guest on your program. Hey, you're very welcome. All right. Well, let me give you a brief introduction. Joel Dubin is a retired cybersecurity consultant and adult survivor of the corporate world. Turn humor author. He developed the seven habits of highly dysfunctional companies from decades of observing messed up companies around the world. He is fluent in several languages and is also available to speak about working in multilingual and multicultural environments. All right. So Joel, as we start off, um, uh, let's take some time now and uh, just touch on what makes companies dysfunctional. In your summary of your book, you list quite a few things. You talk about nonsensical policies and procedures, office warfare, excessive emails and pointless meetings, incoherent communications, bad customer service and marketing, and poor treatment of employees. And I'm sure that that is just the top of the of the, the echelon, that there are a yeah. lot of more things that makes companies dysfunctional. But you, you know, being in the corporate world myself for several decades, I can tell that you've picked the top ones. So do you want to touch on a few of these or you want to touch on all of them? What did you find? Well, I'll, I'll touch as many as, as I can. And Myrna is a fellow corporate, sounds like you're a fellow corporate survivor. You've been through the mill as, as, as well. You know, mm -hmm. but the one thing that you, you you missed in the list was meetings. And one of my habits is if you're not in a meeting, you will be assigned to one. I mean, I <laughs> saw people that were in endless meetings. So I created these characters yeah. called meeting police that, that had little armbands that said an MP and they were standing in the hall. And if they caught someone in the hall, they'd throw them into a meeting, oh, yes. even if it had nothing to do with their work. But yeah, the key the key thing is just that a lot of these companies, they're they're very bureaucratic. And what happens is it ends up being a lot of office politics, a lot of office war warfare, toxic work environments, and so on. You know, I went to a, 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 t a top business school, and I'm not saying that to brag about it, but the one thing that they didn't teach that they should teach that I think is a fundamental thing in this book is psychology. Because a lot of, a lot of the problems in companies are people problems and personality problems, people with power issues. You know, I talk about... Turf battles are a fundamental part of our corporate culture. I mean, I saw companies where, you know, people were building little fiefdoms, little kingdoms, little little nests, bird nests within their company. And I wanted to sometimes grab them on the shoulders and shake them and say, do you know what business we're in? What are we doing? You know, we're not doing business anymore. We're kind of building little teams that are fight, fighting each other on, on the courts, yeah. you know. And yeah. so... That's a big thing. Um, I talk about communication. So the essence there is I talked about excessive emails. You know, you walk in the office in the morning, you got all these emails. It's the first thing you do. You're not doing any work because you're responding to emails, half of which are nonsense, you know, or answering the same question five times or customer complaints, which are common in the dysfunctional company because you're not providing the service very well. You know, and then after that, the next level beyond uh, emails is, you know, meetings. You know, as I mentioned, you know, people constantly being in meetings. I talk about poor customer service. You know, the twin enemies of the dysfunctional company are its employees and its customers. So yeah. the key thing that a dysfunctional company tries to do is drive away its, its customers and then drive its employees nuts or, or take the quality employees and try to drive them out. Because you can't clearly, you can't have creative, independent thinkers within a dysfunctional organization. So I have a lot of different flavors on on all of that. The longest chapter is the one about you know the poor treatment of employees. I talk about poor hiring practices. You know, nowadays everything is automated. You know, you go to a website, you see a job, you send a resume, it, it could disappear in, into outer space. You have no clue 
you know, where it where it's going, you know, and, and clearly systems are set up to not be able to pick out ideal candidates. If anything creative or interesting in your resume, it's going to be cut out. You know, how do they hire people? Um, so, it, it, you know, Myrna, it kind of runs runs the gamut of all of these different things. And the seven habits kind of developed. I noticed these same patterns over and over and over again through all the years that I was working and working with these companies. And that's how I developed these habits. It kind of started out at one company on a whiteboard, just as things would happen every day. I'd, I'd write them down and then eventually I'd, I'd form these seven habits. You know, it's just something that was in common over and, and, and over again. Okay. So, so let's pick one of those. Let's pick the one that... I believe is, is, you know, it's a big one, right? The emails, you know, my daughter is still in the corporate world and um, people send her emails at 10 o'clock at night and she's, she's reading them before yeah. she goes to bed. And then if there's a problem, then she can't sleep. So yeah, a lot of, so how do you, I mean, I'm assuming that when in the, your book, when you touch on these dysfunctions, you're offering some solutions. So how do um, companies get rid of the assessment, you know, emails and meetings? <laughs> two types of, of, I call them vertical communication disturbances and horizontal communication disturbances. So the vertical ones come from on high. That comes from the mountaintop above the clouds. Usually executives in isolated ivory towers, they're saying this thing or that thing. And, and one of the things that you can see often in a dysfunctional company, a lot of people with neck braces because they're they're going like this and like that what did they say today what did they say tomorrow it's something different you know so you don't know what what your company is doing i'd say cut down on that stuff that's one thing that you know you don't have to you know send out every other day we're doing this we're doing that you know do a newsletter once a month or something like that and keep it down to the bare essentials the horizontal ones are are the ones where between co-workers themselves you know, in a dysfunctional organization where you have so many layers of bureaucracy and then on top of that, laid on top of that is what I call silos that don't communicate with each other. When you have a lack of internal communication, antagonistic departments, there isn't any coordination, it's a natural that you're going to have excessive kinds of emails. And what you're mentioning about your daughter getting emails at 10 o'clock at night, amazingly, I was at one company where I had one enlightened manager who if someone sent an email after five o'clock, he would discipline them because he said, this is it, you're done at, at five o'clock. And I know what you're talking about because now in kind of our high tech, you know, internet-based world, there is no breaks anymore. You'll get the emails at 10 o'clock. And I was yeah. doing business internationally and, you know, the world is open 24 hours, you know? Yeah. So if you, someone is having breakfast somewhere, you know, around the world, you're always getting some sort of an email. So mm -hmm. I would say, the fundamental issue, if you can increase internal communication, internal cooperation, you'll have a lot, a lot less emails and people kind of will be, you know, all on the same page. So that, that that's the big thing. But I like that one. No emails after five o'clock. That's an amazing yeah. thing to implement. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know, that you tell people not to call you after nine, then I think that they shouldn't have no emails after five o'clock because guess what? The reason she's reading the emails at, at 10 o'clock is because we all have these notifications. You know, yeah. I'm wearing oh, yeah. a Fitbit. If I was, you know, in the corporate world and someone sends me an email at at um, uh, at 10 o'clock, it comes to my phone, yeah. I mean, to my watch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, these things disrupt your sleep and disrupt. So that's actually a good one to say, even if they don't cut it off at five, cut it off at seven or something. But you're you know, right. Don't be getting up at two in the morning and sending an email because there's a lot of people that don't sleep and do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've gotten emails in the middle of the night and then I come in the morning and I see all these emails. I should actually check in with that manager to see if he's still working at that company because it's such a progressive idea that it's definitely bound to get him fired. <laughs> <laughs> but I also talk about poor, what I call in that very same habit where I say poor communication delivers the message you know, it's habit three, is that, um, you know, a lot of these companies use their own language. I call it corporate speak. You know, all of these things like, you know, I'll pencil it in or, you know, uh, you know, all these crazy terms that you hear over and over again. You know, like when someone is put on probation, it's called a performance improvement program. I called it a PIP. You know, it's, 
<laughs> just say you're on probation. You know, and employees are called. Why can't yeah. you just say staff? What the hell is FTE? I don't you know. I hear that all the time. I actually don't even know what FTE stands for. You know, yeah. just say we need people instead of we need FTE. You know, or actualization, or or you know, little downsides. Well, you know, in some companies, little downsides means that you got to have a longer skirt or a longer pants. You know, and HR doesn't even flinch when they see that. Right. You know, right, what, is, right. what is these? You know, so I talk a lot about what I call corp corp speak, and I actually have a, a dictionary of acronyms in the back of the book because I create all of these crazy acronyms. You know, because I say a company should speak only in acronyms if possible to shorten the. Well, the, they, they tell you never to speak with acronyms to the customer because some of them use the same language when you're speaking to customers and customers have no clue what they're talking about. But I guess what they're saying is that you can use it internally if someone else knows what you're talking about. But yeah. I see where you're coming from that. Right. Because, yeah, if it, you know, you it's a habit. So when you start speaking to your your coworkers or your boss about these acronyms, then you go out and put it in an email or you, you talk to your customer about it and they don't know what you're talking about. All right. And it's just, you go, it's essential that in within the dysfunctional company, different departments have different acronyms so yeah. they can't even talk to each other. Yeah, exactly. So, right, cut it out totally. I hear what you're saying. All right, now the one that I like, and that's why I made it the, our, our headline, is that you're saying that how can companies calculate the asshole density ratio or ADR okay. to determine their level of dysfunction. How or what is okay. the asshole dis density ratio? <laughs> well, okay, that's the number of assholes per square mile per, per square foot within the company. But, so how but who, works... who, who determines that they're an asshole? <laughs> well, it is a humor book, Myrna. So it's kind of there's artistic license there, you know. So you kind of have to make make your personal judgment calls. But you know what I what I talk about. Um, and just kind of as a, as a footnote, I talk about in, in the office, you know, um, I actually started, I actually was close to completing the book just before COVID. And then when COVID hit, I had nothing in there about remote work. So I added all the stuff about remote work. So the reason I'm kind of making that little digression there, I'll explain how you calculate the ADR for remote workers as well. But in an office, you kind of get up from your cubicle because generally you're kind of in a cubicle farm there, right? And then you walk a hundred steps in each direction, and then you count the number of assholes that are in that in each within that square radius. You have to include if there isn't executives nearby, which frequently is is the case in the dysfunctional company. What I call the ESF, the Executive Supplemental Factor, where you throw in, you know, a number of executives that you consider assholes, and you take that and you divide it by the total number of people within that square right, area. But the question is, what makes someone an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> what is the qualifier? <laughs> well, my habit number seven, where I talk about how the company doesn't serve the common good, I talk about all of the various swamp creatures that work within the company and all of the different personalities. And probably the main one, the top one, I call the megalomaniac, usually a narcissist who's power hungry and that's all they're interested in, is their own self-interest and power. They're, they're people that climb the ladders. You can also pick them up because they'll often have a rear view mirror attached to their shoulder so they can see who's trying to stab them in the back when they're not trying to stab <laughs> someone else in the back. You know, yeah. and I talk about sky watchers. You know, I ran into this quite a bit where people that were great managers, but they managed up, not down. They treated their staff like garbage. They didn't pay attention to them. They stole their ideas. They were mm -hmm. condescending, but they were great ass kissers for everybody above them. You know, mm -hmm. and then there's, you know, other things that are kind of obvious people that are complete idiots that were, you know, they might have gotten to that that position because of nepotism or office politics. They weren't qualified or they didn't care, you know, and they just were not not good managers. So that's that's Myrna, that's kind of how I de defined it. I kind of leave that to the end, because what I what I created was this program within the dysfunctional company called the Asshole Management Development Training Program. You know, I call it for short, the acronym is AMDTAP. So that's kind of the program that develops and trains these people to be released out into the world after the company collapses, which it eventually does. All right. Well, listen, no. I'm buying I'm buying the asshole thing here because the ones that you mentioned is very true. I mean, and, and corporations are, listen, it is, it is a community on its own, right? It's... um. 
it's a live entity. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that are walking around that are hurting other people. And you, I love when you say narcissistic, power hungry people, they've got them all there. <laughs> So, um, uh, and you, and it's usually your boss. <laughs> well, you know, the pyramid yes. structure of the dysfunctional company kind of lends itself to that because, you know, you have sharp elbows where you need sharp elbows to kind of edge aside people so you can go make your way up to the top because yeah. as it gets narrow, it gets narrower and narrower and there's fewer and fewer opportunities yes. to kind of rise up. And so that's why. You know, you have to have those those sharp elbows to push people aside. You've got to be kind of aggressive yeah, and, yeah. and rough. It's not conducive to creative, independent type thinking. Those people, anyways, I talk about, you know, in poor treatment of employees and habit six, those people should be weeded out in the hiring process as well. Anybody that says they're a team player, throw the resume out. <laughs> you know, we don't want that kind of crap in our company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, it's it's funny you said, but the hiring process. I mean, yeah, right now I remember when I in in 2015 I was working with a career a career um, person because I'd lost my job. I didn't go back to work. I started working for myself, but I'd lost my job. And when it, they, the company was downsizing, and when they lost your job, they gave you you know access to like a career coach or something. And I was I was very surprised about how now you get into um, uh, jobs where you're right. There's like 200 people applying for a job and they've got this. I'm not sure if it's called AI now, but they've got something that reads the resumes and all they're doing is picking out keywords. So, yeah, you yeah. can you can you can put your resume in such a way that it grabs the attention of the the non-human sorter <laughs> or the computer. And um, you're right. You turn out to be a very bad hire because you know how to pad your resume. If now when people are interviewing one-on-one, -on -one, you, you they can pick out those type of people. You know what I mean? So it's it's true. Bad AI hire is going to make it worse. AI yeah. is making it worse because it predates uh, AI, Myrna. You know, they, they had systems that would check out, pick out keywords. So, mm -hmm. um I always say, well, before I before I get to that, is that I always say, just try to put the word asshole right in the middle of the resume. It'll be picked up. They'll say, that's the candidate we want. Bring him in. Bring him or her in for an interview. You know, but, you but I, always ready. Say, I always say my serious <laughs> advice is that, you know, I've gotten all of my my jobs, gosh, for many years through networking, yes. right? Through networking. So if you're any you know, use your alumni association. You know, I have a, you know, I went to an, an a, a MBA, I went to Kellogg, you know, I had networks through that, you know, use your professional associations, you know, in IT security, cybersecurity, there's various trade organizations, I would go to meetings, I would network, you know, I always was out there, you should always be prepared with a resume and a plan, because you never know when that corporate angel of death is going to tap yes. you on the shoulder and yes. escort you out the door. And it doesn't matter well, what level, said, you know, I have not been in a corporate environment for like eight years or something, and I'm pretty sure it's changing. But in my day, yes, um, you networked. Um, that's what LinkedIn got as, you know, got its start from. I mentioned you said that you're still heavily on LinkedIn because, yeah, you know, your social networks, um, you would go out to networking events with your business card and talk to people. Um, and you actually couldn't get a job unless you know somebody. Well, well, you <laughs> I'm see, not sure how thing. it works now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Many jobs, for instance, even where I network, they would say, well, you know, what you saw online, you still have to apply. You have to go through the procedure. So your resume is in there. But the difference is he or, he or she, the hiring manager who you met, will say, you know what? I'll tag it now. I'll pull it right. out of the system right. and I'll put you right. on, on the pile or the top of the pile. So you may still have to go through that process. I guess what I'm saying is that you got to network. You just can't go, oh, I like that job. That looks good. Right. That looks like you a never good get fit. It. Send a you resume. Never get you never know. 200 people applying yeah. for, for a job or it's probably even more. <laughs> but all right. So that's good. Now, like I said, I love you. You, you said you're a humor writer. And yeah. it, it sounds like you are very humorous. And you say that all good things come to an end. And there are procedures to get rid of employees who haven't expired yet in meetings or at their desk. Of course, 
those who do perish must still be propped up at their workstations as an example to others. <laughs> yeah. and so what advice do you have for companies to get rid of employees who are not pulling their weight? You know, there's a lot of deadweight people that don't right. do anything. And um, you know them because they're being propped up and, and you know that they're not doing all their work. They're delegating everything or whatever yeah. they do. So yeah, how do we get rid of them? <laughs> well, you know, in the dysfunctional company, it's really like a conveyor belt. It's like musical chairs. You get any work. Well, that's not my department. I'll, I'll transfer on to the next exactly. one. Exactly. You know, it just goes, goes on and on. So, you know, I, my point in there, that's interesting you asked that question, Myrna, because I think my point was not so much, you know, about how comp there is there definitely are times that people aren't performing and they need to be removed. Absolutely. I never question that is that it's just sometimes it never made sense. I saw outstanding employees. All of a sudden they'd be called in the manager's office. And the next thing is they're packing their box and they're walking out out the door. And I'd like scratching my head, like, why are they letting you go when they should be letting right that moron go, you know, right. that kind of a thing. So I guess what I would say is that the best way to do it um, here, I'm kind of contradicting myself. I talk about the, the, you know, the performance improvement program, you need to kind of work with the employee. And see if you're seeing substandard work and, you know, and kind of say, look, this, this is not working out. Let's see how we can improve this. And if, if not, then we'll help you move on. This is not the, the place for you, that kind of a thing. So, I think there's a way to do it in a in either a humane fashion or a way where there's kind of a a period where the employee can kind of get ready because they see that the hand you know that the handwriting's on the wall. Too often, also, you get these mergers and acquisitions and and these reorg reorganizations that never made sense. I always looked at employees. I come into a company and work with the same team, and every time I was in there, like you know, I was in there one once, and then I come in six months later for the next review. Oh, we have a new manager. We have a new boss. We report to a new department. It's like it's like employees in this sea of management goo, you know, and and it was just crazy. So the answer to the question is that, you know, you kind of have to see the level of work. You have to be honest about how the, the, the work is going. If this person is not a good fit, if you know, you need to kind of address that, nip that in the bud right away and, and kind of a humane approach to maybe get them out the door or help or help direct them. In, a, in the correct direction. Or maybe it just, maybe it's an internal move too. Maybe they need to go somewhere else. Their skill set is not appropriate for this. They need to be moved somewhere else. But that's the key thing, you know, is to kind of be, you know, be prepared so that when these things happen, you know, you can, you can move on. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, I'm thinking if they're propped up at their desk and they're like dead. <laughs> well, I talk about, <laughs> I talk to their, you know, them. But I mean, I understand that, um, yeah, you know, in I, you know, in the corporate world, I was usually a salesperson and a salesperson, they go by the numbers. And if you're not, if you're not performing, they get rid of you, but you're correct. Um, uh, you know, even a salesperson that's not performing and they can't sell, maybe they're a good customer service person or I mean, if you if you're running a humane company, you will see that maybe there this person doesn't have the strength for this particular job description, but they have strength for something else, and you you transfer them or you you, you whatever instead of saying hey you know pack your box and go. So you know I well you know, one of the things I saw in dysfunctional right? companies in the sales organization now that you mentioned that is that um, either not enough training so the salesperson didn't know you know, what, what to do. And then this thing of, you know, I understand you want to keep production high. You know, as soon as they reached a level, oh, they'd raise the bar. Oh, we're cutting your commission. It's you know? And it's kind of like, you know, the beatings will stop when morale improves, you know, and, and I it's do, I, you know, I know particularly in tech that they yes. could be absolutely ruthless and they just keep yep. raising the bar to a point where it's, it's, it, you know, it's unrealistic. And, and you know why they raise the bar? Cause they don't want to pay commissions yeah, <laughs> because great. what does a salesperson work on commissions right and if they see you're crushing it they raise the bar so that yes it happens all the time you're very right yes, yes and in terms of burying those employees that are propped up at their desk so that's the responsibility of what i call row captains you know you're going to the dysfunctional company it's like a sea of all these cubicles so each cubicle is divided into a set of rows and there's usually what I call a row captain, one person who's responsible for walking up and down the rows, kind of like a prison ward, you know, 
prison guard just to make sure everybody's sitting at their desk. You know, if they find an employee that kind of expired from too much work, first of all, they have to leave the employee there so that other employees can see, you know, if you're doing working hard, this is what can happen to you. This is an example. But then when the employee starts getting moldy, it's the, you know, the role captain's responsibility to arrange for them to be kind of buried and removed. That's very funny. Yes, I listen. Humor writing is good. We're talking about some serious stuff, but we're making it humorous. It's therapy. This is good. I love it. It's I therapy. Love it. It's therapy. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So your book is called The Seven Habits of Highly Dysfunctional Companies. Um, uh, I know that you were a retired cybersecurity consultant. So why did you write it? And what do you want, Um, who, who you expect to read it? And what do you want them to walk away with? Who's your target audience? <laughs> okay, so basically the reason I wrote it was, you know, was, as I say, it was kind of like therapy. You know, I, I did feel like many times there was frustrations where I was banging my head against the wall, either working with clients, some of my clients, and then companies that I worked for the, as as well. You know, although the most recent company that, that I was at, Coal Fire Systems, was a very well-run company. You had management in touch. And you had, you know, a lot of employee participation. It was a very good, well-run operation. But beyond that, I think it was, for me, Myrna, it was a lot of it was therapy. You know, I was carrying around all of this stuff for all these years. And instead of kind of jumping out a window or kind of, you know, slashing my wrist, I thought I better put it put it in writing. And, right. you know, once I retired, I, I, took, I the book has a lot of meat in it. There's a lot of stuff in there. And it was very cathartic and it took me, you know, a, about a year to, to do. My target or, uh, audience is really anybody that works for any kind of a, a company. To some degree, every company has its dysfunctional side. To some degree, even well-run well, even well -run companies, there's always some, some quirk in there. I do find that I get a lot of, of positive feedback from people that work in offices, regular employees. That, that's definitely the case. Now, executives i've had a couple have, have read it and they've actually liked it i expected you know pushback like oh that's not my company we're not like that you know that kind of a thing and i had one executive you a former executive from just by chance that he happens to be a friend of mine retired now worked for a big fortune 500 company he said you know the book sounds like angry were you angry i said oh yes i was you picked that out you know it was a way for me to vent my frustrations you know but you know he said to me that you know when he was at the company, you know, it was pretty well run. And, and then after he had left, there were a number of management changes after he retired and the company he used to work for, he did admit was was pretty messed up, you know, and had and he felt that a lot of management that he had worked with had, and he, or that had come in after he left had needed to be changed because they just didn't didn't they didn't seem to grasp the nettle, so to speak. So. So that, yeah, so my target audience is anybody that really had, has worked in an office or worked for a company. It's kind of, you know, along all of that, you know, like office space and that kind of a thing, all that kind of mentality, so. Yeah, well, I think the greatest change can be made through management, which is why I asked the question, if you're targeting it to supervisors and, and CEOs and, and management, but, um, you're, but, but you're right that, it's the first thing to do is become aware of the dysfunction. So if you are an employee and you're in one of those cubicles and then you understand that your your, your boss is one of these assholes. <laughs> I don't know what you're about information, enough. but now yeah. you're aware of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no yeah, no yeah, no definitely and it's it's also comic relief as as well. You know, so you kind of can laugh at your situation because you know, entrepreneurism and leaving it work and going out on you it's not for everybody you know, a lot of people say oh you got to be on your own well not it's not for everybody you know some people work best in organizations that are just not able or they don't have you know some great you know some great idea i think one of the key things though underlying all of it myrna is, is you know when you talk about management is management that's isolated and, and, and out of touch i talk a lot about you know the, the executives being in, in bunkers or in ivory towers or you know they're an underground facilities they never you know they you, you never see them or they have these town halls you know so the executive comes out and they're flanked by all these assistants just like the president coming out with the secret service you know right, and someone right, asks right. a question and it's not the right question or it's you know something uncomfortable security mm -hmm. people will scoop up that employee and drag them into the parking lot 
you know, and then afterwards, you know, the assistants go away and, you know, the executive goes back, you know, behind a closed, behind a curtain and you never see him or her again. And then you think, do they work for the same company? Do they really know what's going on down here? Right. Not all companies are like that. I don't want to give that impression, but those that are are dangerously dysfunctional. And then they wonder why they can't get ahead. Right, right, right. Exactly. All right. Well, like I said, it sounds like a good read and um, very humorous and obviously, um, you know, giving some good information on um, on um, fixing these dysfunctional companies. And uh, I love where you, you borrowed from one of the, the top books, the, uh, the, the Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Now you have the Seven Habits of Highly Dysfunctional Companies. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Myrna. Yes, I love it. All right. Okay, guys. So um, I enjoyed my conversation with Joel here today. Um, go pick up a copy of his book. I will have a transcript of my conversation with Joel on the show page, which is myhelps.us. I will link out to his book. I will link out to his website. Um, and I will link out to his social media. He's on LinkedIn. What is your website, Joel? It's dysfunctionalcompany.com. Company dot so, what? A dysfunctional comp company dot com. Singular. Yeah, dysfunctional company dot com. All right. Excellent. So I will I will link out to it. So yeah, um uh, go pick up a copy of this book if you're in the corporate world at all. Um and um you'll learn some tips to make your life better and your company better. So um so I'm glad I was able to highlight and showcase um this author. So Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, Joel, as we wrap up, any last words? No, thank you very much for having me here. I hope that uh, hope that your your listeners have a, get a, at least get a few laughs before they, yeah. you know, before they decide to hang themselves from working at their company. So <laughs> yes, humor is therapy. All right. Well, listen, thank you guys for tuning in. Until next time, namaste. Thank you. <laughs>